Tonight, a story of murder. Ray, did you do it? Conspiracy. You knew he was lying. Oh yeah, without a doubt. And survival. They had delivered Chancellor, and he was fighting for his life. Panthers fans knew him as Ray Carruth, a first round draft pick, a star wide receiver. But for the last 19 years, he has lived as Ray Wiggins, North Carolina State Prison inmate number 0712822. Tonight, we go back. I was the first officer on scene. To the night in Charlotte that changed so many lives. How far has the body been shot at? I don't know. And she says, well, your daughter Sharika has been shot. And I'm like, don't play with me. The search for justice in the calculated hit of a pregnant woman. We had very little to work with. The trial. Bam, 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 bam. And the jury's split decision that spared Ray Carruth's life. Let him take a punishment, not of a little boy, but of a man. Now, as he prepares to walk out of prison, Chancellor Lee, his son born during tragedy, walks tall as a man. Say, hey, mommy, Angel. Hey, little boy, Angel. The challenges he's faced every single day. Every part of his brain was affected. And the people who've helped him all along the way. I feel blessed to know Lee the way he is right now. He's going to change the world as he is. Life after death, Ray Carruth and the son who survived. There was life and death, you know, from the very beginning of the story. The ambush and murder of Sharika Adams and the attempted murder of her unborn son, Chancellor Lee, is a case that crossed so many boundaries. It became bigger than Charlotte and the former Carolina Panther at the center of it all. On Monday, October 22nd, Ray Carruth will complete nearly 19 years in prison and re-enter a world where a dedicated grandmother and a loving community helped raise his son. From the very beginning, Eyewitness News pushed to hear from Ray Carruth to get his side of the story. I finally had the chance to speak with him exclusively just days before his release. This is Erica. Erica, this is Ray Carruth. You've never had a chance to just talk, and so you had some things you wanted to say. I guess, honestly, I just want to truly be forgiven. Carruth told me freedom won't feel right without a relationship with his son, Chancellor Lee. My life without making that situation right won't be as good regardless of where I'm at or what I'm doing. It just will never sit well to me. My conscience will never be right until I find a way to be a part of my son's life and help make a difference. That was, that's what means the most to me. Throughout this hour, you'll hear Ray Carruth explain to me how he wants to build that relationship with his son and what his life has been like behind bars. First, let's take a look at how this story began. It looked like an all-American success story, and Ray Carruth was the star. After standout high school and college careers, Carruth's football dream came true. Despite a foot injury that sidelined him in his second year, Carruth seemed to have it all. He was young, rich, and in the spotlight for Charlotte's new favorite team. The Carolina Panther Ray Carruth has been arrested and charged on three charges in connection with the shooting of his pregnant girlfriend, Sharika Adams. America had seen this story before. A beautiful woman murdered, a football star on the run. It had been four years since O.J. Simpson. Just like Simpson's trial, Carruth's case was on national TV. It was a spectacle. It was surreal. A city that six years earlier didn't even have an NFL team now had a football star on trial for murder. I'm 286 pounds. Okay, I would rip you like a rag doll. This drama played out for months. He gave me $100 and he told me to take his friend to get the gun. Testimony about drug deals, about a darker side to a quiet, almost childlike football player, and about a plot to kill. 
Just the story of an athlete's dreams, of the nightmare that ended Sharika's life, or the birth of hope in Chancellor Lee. This book is still being written. Tonight, we're digging into the moments, decisions, and twists of fate that brought us to this current chapter, and uncovering how Ray Carruth and the son who survived plan to turn the next page. He was born Ray Lamar Wiggins, but used his stepfather's surname, Carruth. And Carruth is the name that captured national headlines following the murder of Sharika Adams. Reporter Mark Becker covered the case as it unfolded, and tonight takes us through its twists and turns with the investigators who lived it. It began as a night at the movies, football star and his pregnant girlfriend driving to a South Charlotte theater with two tickets to a film called The Bone Collection. He needs her to go where he can't. It was a tense murder mystery with the police detective trying to track down a killer. This crime scene was staged. There's no question the perp knows forensics. As she drove home from the theater that night, Sharika Adams had no idea that she was about to become the victim in a very real murder mystery. One where the prime suspect would be her boyfriend, Carolina Panther Ray Carruth. A mystery that would start with her own desperate call to 911. Clearly in pain and struggling to stay conscious, Sharika tried to tell 911 operators where she was and what had happened to her. I wasn't actually originally assigned to the call itself, but uh, I was close by and I figured, why not? You know, it seemed like a simple accident. Um, it ended up being far from that. Peter Grant was the first officer to get to Sharika that night. The driver's side window of her car had been shattered with five bullet holes, but somehow she was alive. She's obviously conscious talking. She's in, a, in somewhat of a state of shock at that point in time. Um, it was very traumatic what had happened to her. Grant stayed with Sharika as an ambulance rushed her to the hospital, still alert and still talking. I'm trying to get the information of who she is, and she's more concerned about telling me that her baby's daddy was the one who... That her baby's daddy was the one who... Yep, did it. Ray Ray. Ray Cruz, yeah. So my first assignment was to go to the hospital. Detective Daryl Price would get to the hospital later that morning. When I got there, the family was there. Um, she has a pretty large family. Um, and at some point that morning, uh, Ray Carruth came in. That was the first time I saw him. And the family pointed him out and said, this is her boyfriend, Ray. He's a Carolina Panthers football player. Of course, I didn't know him. Price spoke briefly with Carruth but his focus was on Sharika. Doctors had delivered her baby with an emergency C-section, and soon after, a nurse came out and took Price back to her room. She was very cognizant of what was going on around her. She, had, she was intubated, she had a, a breathing tube in, so she couldn't talk. Unable to talk, Sharika scrawled her answers on a piece of paper. She told Price they'd left the theater in separate cars, then afterwards, she said that she was following Ray and that somebody pulled up beside her and shot her. And, you know, we asked the question, do you think Ray had anything to do with this? And she just drew a question mark. It was a question mark. It was a question mark. A question mark. But for detectives, it would also be a starting point. Did you suspect him from the beginning? Well, you had to. I mean, Sharik Adams called in and said that, uh, pretty much named his, him as stopping in front of her and she believed that he was involved in it. Sergeant Tom Athey led the investigation and they would start by talking with Ray Carruth. What did he say? He didn't really know anything about anything at that time. First interview, he's, he's basically still the bereaved boyfriend and father and you know, he's, he don't know what happened. Before they left, Athey casually asked Carruth to see his cell phone. It would be the key to unlocking the case. Right, we knew what numbers he was calling and what numbers was, were calling Ray. They saw Carruth had made several calls within minutes of the shooting 
And by tracking those calls to specific cell phone towers, they could find out where he was. That was kind of the first time we ever used cell phone triangulation to pinpoint a location. At first, Carruth had told them he was miles away when the shooting happened. But the towers would tell a different story. We were able to triangulate where the cell phone calls were coming from, and they were in the same exact spot she was shot in. So we knew he wasn't over uh, off of McKee Road. We knew he was on Ray Road. You knew he was lying? Oh, yeah. Without a doubt, we knew. Searching Carew's cell phone records, they saw he'd placed several of those calls to a 24-year-old named Michael Kennedy, and they brought Kennedy in for questioning. So we told him, we, we, we believe that you didn't kill anybody, but we also know that you were there because your cell telephone shows up at the location where this occurred. So after some, uh, some amount of time, he, he eventually uh, tells the story. What did he tell you? Uh, that he had met at uh, Ray Carew's house uh, with another, another person that uh, I believe he called New York, uh, described him, uh, said he'd never met him before, and that, that he was in a car with uh, uh, this New York and another person. Uh, I believe his name was Stanley Abraham. And that uh, they waited on a call from Ray Carruth uh, to follow them back to uh, her house, and that at some point Ray Cruz pulled in front of her, put his brake lights on, stopped where she couldn't go anywhere, their car pulled alongside of hers, and New York fired shots into the uh, into her car. It didn't take long for detectives to identify New York as Van Brett Watkins, a man who hadn't been on the radar before. We went out and picked him up, and now he had a very violent criminal history, so. Now we're kind of on to something. Like, how is Ray Carew connected to this guy with this many violent felonies? For hours, Watkins insisted he didn't know Ray Carew. But then something detectives never saw coming changed his attitude. It was the holidays, so we went and got him a plate of food. We had had a uh, unit dinner that, or lunch that day. So we fixed him a plate. We were sitting down eating. And on the television, there just happened to be a press conference going on. And Ray Carruth was speaking in that press conference. And a reporter asked him, what do you think ought to happen to the person that, that did this? And he said, well, I think they ought to get the death penalty. And that's when Watkins just put his fork down and he said, let's go back to the room. And we went back in the room and he laid it all out for us. Watkins told detectives he wanted them to know the truth. He admitted he fired the shots, but that the one who was calling those shots that night was Ray Carruth. And I think had he not gotten so angry, had he not seen that interview, he would have never confessed. And had he never confessed, it would have been a lot harder to connect the dots. So a plate of food and a, and a TV interview basically did it. Sometimes you just get lucky. By then, police had picked up the third person in that car, a teenager named Stanley Abraham. So there was only one person left to bring in, Carruth himself. Once we uh, went to his house and told him he was under arrest. How did he react? Well, first he had to put his clothes on. He was completely naked, and he had another girl in the, in the, uh, in the house with him. Wait a minute. His girlfriend's lying in the hospital, but he's already got another girl in the... Right. Comes to the door completely naked. Carruth got dressed and went with detectives to the police department. Once he gets down, he's confronted with everything. Denial or not, he was under arrest. Carruth posted $3 million bond and was released from jail, still saying nothing publicly about his role in the shooting. Meanwhile, detectives turned their attention back to the hospital and Sharika Adams, who was slowly slipping away. Based on all the, 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 the medical uh, advice that we were getting from the hospital, there's no way she was going to survive that. So it's just a matter of time. We're just waiting. The waiting ended on December 14th. Four weeks after she was shot, Price was called back to the hospital. I didn't have a lot of faith that she was going to pull through. But I know the family, you keep faith going until the day it happens. And I, I know that it crushed them. Sharika Adams had died. And Ray Carruth was now facing a murder charge. I think Darrell was still at the hospital. He, you know, he called us and said, hey, you know, she's passed away at this time. So we, uh, we go and uh, look for Ray Carruth, and uh, he's not there. Carruth was on the run 
and detectives were scrambling to find him. Well, he, he then they got a call that. from an unlikely ally, the bondsman who he put up the millions to get Carruth out of jail. I don't remember the date, but I do remember him calling over and talking to us and said, I just got a phone call from someone in Tennessee, and Ray is in Tennessee. But we found out where he, we believe he's at. Uh, so we wanted to go and pick him up. Uh, we get overruled, and they want to send, I think, the FBI out to find him. With the FBI now on the case, agents in Nashville got in touch with the young woman who called the bondsman, and they closed in on Carruth. They make contact with this girl at this hotel, and she kind of motions that he's not here, but kind of gives a motion that uh, points to the car, toward the car. And uh, eventually they open the trunk and there pops Ray. It was one final ironic snapshot from a twisted script that had seen a young mother murdered and a young man transformed from football star to suspected killer. Here's a guy that's, that, that potentially could be a multimillionaire at a very young age, winds up, uh, in the trunk of a car somewhere in Tennessee. With a pee bottle. With a pee bottle and some money trying to hide from the police. Of course, that wasn't the end of the Ray Carruth story, but it was the end of a chapter that captivated this community for more than a month as we hung on every development of that investigation. And of course, Mark, it didn't end there. No, it would be another year before that case would go to trial. And when it did, it brought its own set of surprises We'll take you behind the scenes of that monumental case later on. We have expanded coverage of the investigation into this case on our WSOC TV app. Mark walks you through the critical evidence from the gun to the phone records. Download the WSOC TV app for free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire.